Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are doing a mid middle kind of a series that I just kind of stuck in the middle. We're 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 studying Genesis, but not today. You know, I, I decided to do a little mini series called the Abundant Life, and today we're going to be talking about practical tools for a plan for parenting. But before you panic, and some of you may panic and go, I don't have any kids. I don't even like them. I don't want to have them. Or they're all grown up. Praise the Lord. They're out of my life. And this is not going to apply. I have news for you. Every word I'm about to preach applies to every single person in this room. You want to know how I know that? Because the truth of the matter is, you either have a child, you were a child, you're going to be near a child, or you may have forgotten that God calls you a child. And you have to enter into the kingdom of God by becoming a child. Therefore, understanding parenting is important to you. Because how many of you know God is a parent and you a child? So if you understand how God wants you to be a parent on this earth, then you will go, why does he want me to act like that? Because that's how God acts. Does that make sense? And that's going to help you relate to him. So this is going to apply to you no matter who you are. Now, some of it, I, I admit, I have aimed it towards people who are parents today that are dealing with uh, the monsters, I mean the kids at home. They're dealing with them, and they have to deal with them on a regular basis. So it is aimed in that general direction, but it does apply to everybody. And I got to thinking, how can I introduce this subject in a way that would really get you to understand why this is so important? And I got to thinking about my grandma. Now, my grandmother, my grandfather, they had nine children, okay? And my grandpa was one of 14 children, so the idea of chaos was normal for them. And, you know, so grandma often said to, to us uh, grandkids, she often said, you know, kids, I want you to understand, I understand, I completely know why alligators eat their own young. I completely understand it. Because I had six boys and three girls. And the six boys all should have been locked up before they were eight. I'm sure of it. And she would tell us these horrific stories. I'm about to tell you one of these stories. It's a little on the, on the uh, ribald side, so be careful. Uh, but the, it's a true story, mostly. And the thing is, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which of my uncles this applies to. Because they all deny it. It wasn't me. I am pretty sure it was my Uncle Dan and my Uncle Ray. But I don't know for sure. But here's the story. You have to understand that with six boys and three girls and you live in a two-bedroom house with one bathroom, there's going to be some warfare. And they got used to the fact that people are going to do multiple things in the bathroom at multiple times. So you had one boy in the tub and the other boy on the throne doing what he needed to do. And they're doing what they need to do. And the boy in the bathroom, which I am reasonably confident was my Uncle Dan, was splashing my Uncle Ray, who's sitting on the pot. He's going, pss, pss, pss. and And my, my Uncle Ray's like, knock it off. You know what I mean? And they're having this battle back and forth. And Grandma's shouting at him down the hallway, would you knock it off? You know, it was one of those situations, right? And finally, my Uncle Ray says, I am warning you, you keep splashing me, and there's going to be consequences. And so my uncle, like this, well, my uncle Ray just reached into the pot and got a sample of his deposit and threw it at my other uncle's head. That's a true story. Now, it doesn't end there because the uncle in the bathtub attacked the uncle on the pot because of this assault. And the next thing you know are two naked boys rolling down the hallway I mean, just fighting like cats and dogs with my grandmother, screaming at him, chasing him with a belt, and they rolled all the way down the stairs, and then it was just one of those situations. To this day, Uncle Ray and Uncle Dan will not admit who was in the tub. <laughs> they won't deny the story completely. It wasn't me. It was probably Uncle Alex or somebody else. But it illustrates the point. The very first point that we need to understand, and it's not something I put up here, but it is a truth that we really need to get. How many of you know that children are sinners? 
If you don't, just look at my uncles. They will express it for you. I've got lots of other stories to help you understand that children are born sinners. This is something that we really got to get into our heads. This, this is something that we really need to understand. It is a truth we need to get because the world tells you that children are basically good, don't they? The world says that all children are wonderful and all you have to do is get them in the right environment and everything will be perfect. It's true. That's what the world says. I know because I was a, I, I was a public school teacher for basically 20 years. And during that time, we're constantly being told that it's not the children's fault for their behavior. It's the environment. And if we just change the environment, everything will be good. You don't need to discipline children. You don't need to give them any rules. They'll figure it out for themselves because they are naturally good. No, they are not. And neither are you? See, this is the other thing. Most of us walk around with this false notion that I'm a good person. How many of you have heard that? No, you're not. No, you're not. The only one who is good is God alone. Any goodness that you have is because you reflect him. Because without God, you are a savage. Isn't that true? Left to ourselves, what would we do? We'd eat each other. Cannibalism. Human sacrifice, abuse, that's the nature of the human being. Without God, we have no restraints. And without those restraints, we would destroy ourselves. Human beings are naturally bent towards being sinners. And it's, un it's important that we understand that principle right off the bat. So what do we do? What do we do? Because we're supposed to be children of God. We have children that we have to deal with. They are naturally sinners. We are naturally sinners. So what is it that we're going to do to keep our children from destroying themselves? And if you don't think that they are destroying themselves, just go volunteer at that school over there for a little while. And you will find out in a very big hurry. Isn't that right? So what do we do? Well, I think the answer begins in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. The book of Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible, you will find it in chapter 6, verse 4. This is called the Shema in Hebrew, and it says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, before we continue, hear, O Israel. Who's Israel? For those of you that are new, Israel is the country, the people, that God was talking to, okay? This group of people that God spent uh, several hundred years trying to pound into their heads what holiness really is. So he's speaking to them. But the word Israel, the name means he who contends or wrestles with God. So who would that be? Everybody. We all wrestle with God, don't we? So he's saying, hey, you. You that wrestle with God, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now that covers the triune being, doesn't it? You are a triune being. You have a soul. You live in a body, your strength. And you have a mind, will, and emotions. And God is saying, I am one, I am singular, and you must be singularly focused on me your whole life. Everything you do, say, and think needs to be focused in on loving me. Verse 6, and these words which I command you today, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. These words I command you today shall be in your heart. That means from your gut. That means from here, right? We're not just talking about a religious idea. We're not just talking about ceremony. We're talking about something that you sincerely do from your heart, from the center of who you are. And what shall you do with this? Verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And the first thing we need to understand is that you are your child's primary teacher. 
You see, our whole culture is wrapped around the idea that the professionals need to teach your children. I have news for you. Their entire philosophy is based on the concept that there's no such thing as truth. You can't communicate truth no matter what you come up with anyway. That's the whole philosophy over in that school. I know because I had to take more than 30 credits of this stuff where we learned in college and had to write essays in order to become a public school teacher in order to understand the concept that there is no such thing as real truth. Everybody has their own truth and we need to make everybody equal. That's what they're teaching over there. If you do not counter this in your home, you will lose your children. You are the child's primary teacher. And God himself is saying this. You, not the teachers, not the pastors, not the youth leaders, but you. You shall teach them diligently. That means consistently over time to your children. When? Every chance that you get. You talk about them when you're sitting down at your house. You make up your mind. I'm going to talk about what, 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 what it says in God's word about how to live. And when I'm sitting in my house, when I'm walking down the street, when I lie down, when I rise up, that covers pretty much everything, doesn't it? God wants you as a parent to be constantly and consistently teaching your children. You must take responsibility for your children's education in what is truly important. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And that is by far more important than any calculus or chemistry. And I'm the biology teacher and I am here to tell you this is 100,000% more important than anything I ever taught in a public school classroom. You must teach your children, and you are the primary person to do it. Now, I think the first important principle here, or the next important principle here, is that raising kids, now listen to me on this carefully, raising kids is not about a discipline program, contrary to popular opinion. It's not about learning to relate to your children. It's not about becoming their friend. It is not even about loving your child. All of those things are good things. It's important to have a discipline program. It's important to relate to your kids. It's important to love them. But it's not as important as this one thing. It says that you are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your soul. You see, in context, he's talking about how to teach your children, isn't he? But what's the first thing about teaching your children? you got to love God. Do you see that? In other words, we as parents are so busy trying to change the kids and their behavior that we forget that we need to change ourselves and our behavior before we do anything about theirs. You see, kids are a lot like sharks. They can smell two drops of blood two miles away. And if they sense hypocrisy in you, you cannot, you cannot Live your life as do as I say, but not as I do. It does not work. The first and most important principle, if, you are, if you're a young person and you're thinking, someday I want to have children, then the first thing you need to understand about having children is that you need to learn to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And until you do that, you have no business being a parent. And if you are a parent and you have neglected your relationship with the living God, today is the day to change it. You need to make up your mind that I am going to be the example. Why? Because kids look up to parents, don't they? They look up to adults. It's just like new believers. Somebody becomes a Christian, what do they do? They look up to the Christians who are older than they are. They've been Christians longer. We, we naturally look up to role models. We all need this. God himself understands this, so he sent Jesus to be the ultimate role model for us. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Just look at me. This is how we're supposed to do things. This is how we're supposed to live. That's why God does that. Now listen, if you parents are not good role models for your kids, then their peers will become their role models. Do you want this? If you are not a good role model, then the sports figures and the famous actors and actresses, they will become your children's role models. Human beings are always looking for someone to look up to. All human beings do it. It's our natural bent. Did you know that? You do it all the time. I don't care if you're 50 years old, you're still looking up to 
my parents, somebody else who's more successful than I am. You, we all do it, don't we? We're constantly looking at, the, oh, boy, I wish I could just live my life like that. We all do it. Your kids do it, too. You need to be their primary role model. And the first and most important thing is that you need to prioritize your life in terms of making Jesus the king of your life. Now, for the last three weeks in a row, I have been emphasizing this point, haven't I? Make Jesus your king. I've been trying to get you to understand what kings are. Because we live in a democracy, and if we don't like our king, we vote him out. God doesn't care about your vote. He is the king. There's no voting him out of office. He is the king. And I've been emphasizing that he needs to be the king of your life. And if you are making up your mind to live any way you choose, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm go I make up my own mind, nobody tells me how to live, and so on and so forth, then you're in rebellion against the rightful king. You cannot expect God's blessing in your life, and you certainly cannot expect his blessing in terms of you being a parent. So don't be completely surprised when your kids are completely out of control if you yourself have not submitted yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But for the last two weeks, I've been, the last three weeks now, I've been saying you've got to make Jesus the king of your life. But I think I've missed something. How do you do that? Seriously, how? It's more than just I got down on my knees and I prayed and I asked Jesus to forgive me from my sins. We need something a little bit more than that. We need something a little more concrete. How do you really make Jesus the king of your life? The answer is in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. The book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14 says this. Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Now let's analyze this verse. The word sincerity here in Hebrew is tamim. Tamim means complete, whole, entire, or sound. Now it comes from a root word in Hebrew that refers to sacrifices. Now let me explain this. In the Old Testament... When they brought a sacrifice to the altar to pray, God said, you must bring the very, very best sacrifice you have. So you go out to your flocks of sheep, and you don't go, you know what, I can do without that one because it's got a disease, because it's ugly, whatever. We'll sacrifice that one. God says, no, 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 I don't take your leftovers. You give me the best. In fact, you should pick the prized sheep out of your pen. The one that will win the award. The one that you know is more valuable than every other sheep in the pen. That's the one you bring to the altar. Do you see that? Now, the vast majority of people in today's world do not understand the concept of sacrifice, do they? They don't get it. They do not understand the sacrifice of what it means to give their very best, because they don't. How many of you know, if you don't know this, just hang around here for a little while, how many secondhand things this church gets? You'd be shocked. You know, that, 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 you know, that uh, sofa's got a stain on it, I'll just give it to the church. Is that giving your best? What should you do if you want to give something to the church? Go out and buy a brand new one. So far, that has never happened in this church. We just happily accept the secondhand stuff because that's all we're going to get. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's not this. And if it pricks your conscience, that's between you and the Lord. What are you giving? What are you sacrificing? And he's saying, you need to serve me in sincerity. That means in the same way that you're supposed to give the complete, the whole, the entire, the best sacrifice out of your flocks. That's what you're supposed to bring to me. That's how you're supposed to serve me and love me. With that same completeness. That same wholeness. In other words, you've got to be completely and totally sold out to following Jesus with the very best that you have. 
Now, some of you do this. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pick on one small group here that I just love these guys. They come in on Saturday, and they clean this place. And it takes three, four hours for them, and they mop every square inch of this place. They give their best. They are determined that this place is going to be so clean you could eat off these floors because they are determined to give their best. That's how you're supposed to sacrifice for the living God. So I applaud our cleaners that come in on Saturday. And you know what? They do it without any organization. We haven't organized them. We haven't even asked them. They volunteer. That's what it means to give with sincerity. Are you following me? Now, God is saying here in this verse, you need to serve me the same way that you would give the very best sheep from your flock. So notice what he says. He says, put away the gods which your fathers served. Throw them out. Get rid of them. Now, for us in the 21st century, most of us don't walk around with little pocket idols that we pull out and pray to. So we look at that verse and we go, I don't get it. That doesn't make sense to me. Put away the gods which your father served, now here's the key, on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Now, what were these gods like? What is he talking about here? You see, the truth of the matter is, these people served these gods because these gods made them feel good. That's the truth. These entire temples were all wrapped around the ideas of sex, alcohol, and drugs. It's true. What they would do in order, the priest, you know, they want to hook people to get, get you to bring your sacrifices to their altars, right? You bring a sacrifice into the altar of, say, Isis, and what you're going to get when you come in is you're going to get a special drink of this magic elixir that we've made and blessed by the God. Well, of course, that magic elixir is full of opium. So you're going to get yourself wasted. Then they're going to have an incredible, they're going to have drums and smashing things, and, and, and I mean, everybody's high, and it was incredible what was going on in there. The sexually transmitted diseases were staggering in the ancient world. Better than 40% of Greece had syphilis. I mean, it was just everywhere because that's how they worshipped. Does that make sense? Well, the priests are making huge money off this, aren't they? Because you're bringing in those sacrifices and they're going and selling it or you're bringing in the money. You're sacrificing to these gods so that you can feel good for a short period. Does that make sense? Do you see how it's the same today? We do it all the time, don't we? We sacrifice ourselves, our dignity. For example, the God of success. I have got to be successful in my job. So I'm willing to sacrifice my integrity. I will lie. I will cheat. I will steal all the way to the top. I used to be a real estate agent. And the number of times that I had to stop clients from just flat real estate fraud, I, I lost count. I literally lost count of the number of times that people were willing to lie on those, those, those applications in order to get money out of a bank, and they figured they deserved it. Anybody who's been in real estate has seen this. We will sacrifice our integrity to make money. The God of money, the God of success. We will sacrifice for pleasure, which is why the porn industry is bigger now than ever in history. Billions upon billions of dollars. We will sacrifice our dignity, our marriages for a few minutes of a good time. We sacrifice to these gods all the time. We sacrifice for stuff, don't we? So we're wrapped up and credit up to our eyeballs even though the Bible says be beholding to no man. God's word is credit's a bad idea. Don't do it. The majority of us are up to here. Why? We've sacrificed ourselves for the bigger, better car, the bigger, better junk in our houses. We can't afford it when we've become slaves in order to keep up the payments. We have sacrificed to these gods. And he is saying, you want to serve me with sincerity? Throw away the gods that your fathers have served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Quit living like that. Dave Ramsey says it this way. He says, learn to live now like no one else lives so that later you can live like no one else lives. If you learn to follow the principles of God's word now in your life, 
then later you will be the one that is blessed and everybody's going to look at you and go, how did that happen? Does that make sense? So why do you think we have these, these classes here in this, this, this room or in our church about how do you follow the principles of money that God lays out so that you will not be sacrificing to the gods of this world and you won't be a slave? That's why we do that. And he's saying, if you want to serve God, if you, if you really want to follow me, you've got to throw these gods out. You have to choose to prioritize the living God, and that is the first step on being a good parent. Now, how many of you know that if you're not a parent, that still applies to you, what I just said? Throw out the gods of this world. We all need to do it, parent or not. But that is the first step towards being a great parent. It's working on getting ourselves locked down. Ourselves. See, kids want realness. That's the first key to great parenting. Good parenting begins with a choice to serve God sincerely. It starts with you deciding, I'm going to serve God. I don't care what I have to change in myself. I don't care how many times I have to come up here and pray with one of these pastors about this habit or that habit. I will prioritize serving God. When your kids see you do that, then your words to them about how to live will resonate. But how many of you know if you're telling your kids, don't be a drunk, but you're a drunk, they ain't listening? You've got to learn to be the role model. And guess what? It's not natural. It's a choice. You can't fake it. It's a choice. So let's, let's take a look a little deeper about this. Deuteronomy 6, 7, it says, You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Okay, the words teach diligently here are shanan in Hebrew. Shanan means to sharpen a weapon or to pierce. Now this is extremely important. You shall pierce. You shall pierce your children with my teachings just as if you were taking my teachings and drilling it to their ears like piercing their ears with an earring. That's what he wants you to do. That's pretty intense, isn't it? I remember when I got my ear pierced. For those of you that did not know, yes, I do have a pierced ear. Why? Because I was 19 and an idiot. But anyway, (sighs) I don't wear it anymore. My wife doesn't like it. But anyway... I had one earring because back in the 80s, that was cool. But anyway, I remember getting that ear pierced because I wasn't a little kid. I was a big, dumb kid. But anyway, I'm in there, and the lady comes up, you know, and she puts that thing to my ear, and she goes, pink, like this. And I went, ow! And she went, you're a big baby. And I went, (laughs) ow. You know what I mean? It hurts. And God is saying, you need to pierce my teachings to your kids just like piercing their ears. And guess what? It's going to hurt. We don't like that as parents. We don't want to do that as parents because it's painful. We don't want to see our kids go through anything that's discomfort. So we try to avoid anything that might hurt them. But look what happens. Now, this is probably the key, the center of this message. Listen to this. I'm going to give you two examples from the Old Testament of men who did not do this, and I want you to see the result. The first you're going to find in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Don't flip over there. I'm just going to tell you the story. The second is in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Now, we're going to talk first about Eli. Eli was a great priest. You will look in God's Word, and you will never find anywhere in God's Word where it says anything bad about Eli. Eli was a good guy. He was an awesome guy. He was a great priest. Everybody liked him. Now, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And he was the high priest, and so they became priests as well. Does that make sense? But Eli knew, now listen carefully, those two boys were ripping people off. They were flat stealing. And not only were they stealing, they were using their position. You see, people would come into the temple, and the only way to get a sacrifice done was to go through the priest, and they had to approve it, and they got the kickback. Does that make sense? They're ripping people off. Not only that, Hophni and Phinehas, if they liked the girl, they would sleep with her too, and they would say, look, you cannot have a sacrifice, and and it's not going to go to God, and 
and you're, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't sleep with me. And they would, they would sleep with uh, the women. They were stealing. They were bad dudes. What did Eli do? Nothing. He didn't do anything. Not anything of consequence. Did he yell at them? Oh, yeah. The Bible says he scolded them. My sons, why are you doing this? He hollered at them. But he did, listen, nothing to restrain them. He just yelled at them. And, of course, they did what? Whatever they wanted. They just kept doing it because, you know, you can yell at me all you want, old man. I got stuff to do. The other great man that we need to do, talk about, is King David. David was the greatest hero in all of Israel's history. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. It doesn't get any better than David. And he was a horrible parent. Because he would not do anything that would make his sons uncomfortable. His son Amnon had a, had a lust problem, big time. So bad that Amnon raped his own half-sister Tamar. Well, Tamar's brother, Absalom, of course, hears about it and is enraged and wants to kill his brother. So what does David do? Nothing. Yelled at him. Said, you're bad. But he did nothing to restrain them. He did nothing that might make them uncomfortable. Now, let's think about this for a second. There's no spankings going on here. There's no restraints going on here. Eli, what should he have done? What could he have done? He could have come in and said, boys, you have crossed the line. You're fired. Throw them out of the temple. He could have done that, but it would have been a big scandal. Big scandal. It would have ruined his reputation. It would have ruined their reputation. He would have hurt their feelings. So he did nothing. What was the result? Is God going to put up with this? Not a chance. Hophni and Phinehas were both killed on the same day. And Eli, when he heard his sons were killed, he realized their deaths, their blood is on my head. And it was so distressing to him that he literally fell over backwards. He was sitting on a chair, fell over backwards, hit his head, and he died as well. That's what happens. What about David? David did nothing but yell at Amnon. Why did he not do anything? He could have said, Amnon, I don't care that you're the crown prince. I don't care that there's going to be a scandal. I don't care about the fact that the consequences that you need to face are going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to do something to keep you from doing what you... You've raped your sister. You're going to jail, pal. He did not do that. He could have. He did not. So Absalom killed his brother. Now you've got a murder in the family, don't you? David could have done something for, to Absalom too. But you see, Absalom was second in line to the throne. Big scandal. So David did nothing. He said, you can't come into my presence anymore, Absalom. Big deal. He didn't do anything to restrain Absalom. So what did Absalom do? In his resentment, in his hatred, for his own father. He started a civil war and tried to take the throne. Not only that, he slept with his own father's wives. Just to make the point. And in the end, he was killed. And when he died, what did David do? He threw up his hands and said, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Because he knew that his own refusal to restrain that boy led to his death. Absalom could have been a great man. But his father did nothing to restrain him. Now listen to me. God is a good parent. He will restrain you. He is not like David or Eli. He will restrain you. He will not let you continue to get away with whatever you're doing. If you are doing something and you know it is ungodly, God will not let you get away with it. He is not David. He is not Eli. He's God. And he expects you to do the same with your children. Now, your children, they're not going to like it. That's why it's called piercing. It doesn't feel very good. But here's the key. God is a good parent. He's going to restrain us. It will sting. So we must restrain our kids, even if it stings. 
like getting your ears pierced. We must be willing to restrain our children. It is crucial that we understand this concept. Look at Proverbs 19.18. It says, discipline your son or your daughter for, it is, for in it there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. This is extremely important. The word discipline here is yaser in, in Hebrew, and it means to chastise with blows. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, it's get out the spanking paddle and get her done. To instruct or to discipline. Now, this is extremely important. These words, listen to me, parents, are in the imperative in Hebrew. Imperative means do it. It's not a suggestion. It's not a suggestion. It's do it. And the word discipline means to narrow in or to create a hedge. That's what it means. You set boundaries for your kids and don't let them cross those boundaries. You put them on the correct path. You hem them in. It will make your kids uncomfortable. They will not like you for doing it. I have five children. I've done this. I know. I have hedged them in. I'm going to pick on my second son for a minute because he's not here. Now, but I talked to him yesterday. Here's a young man. He just got married, phoning me up to say, Dad, I am so glad that you fought me when I was 16. Why does he say that now when he's turning 20 and he's in the Navy? Because he sees so many other young men his age that are getting thrown out of the Navy or thrown into the brig. He's lost count of the number of his friends that have been arrested because their parents never disciplined them. But I disciplined him and I taught him. He's grateful for it now. He didn't like it when he was 16. Trust me, he didn't. He did not like it. But I was not willing to be a, a party to his death. And I said, I don't care how uncomfortable it's going to make you. No, you will not go over to your girlfriend's house when her parents are not there. Ain't going to happen. Won't let you do it. But dad, everybody, I don't care what everybody else is doing. These are the boundaries in my house. And I had to one time literally sit on my porch all night so that he wouldn't crawl out the window. And he tried it, and there I am going, how you doing, boy? And he's like, oh. I go, bed. But I'm not willing to be a willing party to his death. Now listen, it is true. Be, listen to me on this. The Bible never, 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 never endorses abusing anyone. That's not what I'm talking about here. Never endorses sadism or anything like that. But it does say make it sting. It does say set the boundary, and if it stings, so much the better because they're going to remember it. Now, if you think that I'm overstating the case, I'm not. My father works in prison ministry. Three times a week, he's at Donovan State Prison or wherever it is, preaching to the inmates there. Doug was also a part of prison ministry, and what did you tell me? Every single one that you were dealing with, they all told you the same story. It's not my fault. They're going to blame everybody and anybody because nobody ever restrained them. And they didn't understand the concept of why the cops are not just letting them go home. They didn't get it until they're in jail. And even in jail, they still don't get it. I was at Alcatraz prison and I met this guy. His name is Jim Quillen. There's his picture. Now when I met Jim, uh, he was signing this book. And I uh, was there to, you know, tour Alcatraz and see it and he was down by the dock signing this book. He would not go up to the blockhouse. He said, I spent enough time up there. He spent 10 years at Alcatraz in solitary confinement for most of, those, most of that time. Now, when I talked to Jim, he had gone to prison for uh, uh, armed robbery, uh, stealing a car, crossing lines, kidnapping, that sort of thing. Didn't kill anybody. He said, but it was only God's grace because I was well on my way. Now, at that time in California, I said to Jim, I, you know, I'm just curious because I say stupid things all the time. I said to Jim, Jim, what do you think about California's new three strikes law? Because in California at the time, the law had just been passed. You have three felonies. It's automatic uh, life sentence. And I, was, I figured this guy would have 
something to say about that. And I was right. Jim said, I don't believe in the three strikes law. I believe in the one strike law. I said, what do you mean? He said, the first time some kid goes and does something as dumb as I did, you throw him in prison for 10 years and you make it the most miserable experience he has ever had and it'll be one strike because he'll never do that again. Trust me, after Alcatraz, I've been as clean as a whistle. One strike. So I got sitting and talking to Jim and he told me a little bit about his story. Parents never disciplined him, never restrained him. By the time he was 16, he was stealing cars. They yelled at him. And he laughed at them. It wasn't until he stole a car and crossed state lines with the person who owned the car in the back seat that it became kidnapping, grand theft, and all that, and he went to prison. But when he went to San Quentin, he had never been restrained in his life. So here he is in this you know, cell. So he fought everybody, and he ended up in Alcatraz because they're not going to mess around with you. Does that make sense? If you don't restrain your children, the law will. The law will. And Jim is a living example of that. Proverbs 29, 15 says this, The rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child that's left to himself disgraces his mother. Now, this is extremely important. <coughs> the Hebrew word here is actually the rod and correction. In other words, it implies that I don't just beat my kid. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, I explain to the child why you're getting this consequence. I, it's the rod and correction. That's what I do. And I use loving terms when I do it. I am willing. Okay, last night, Miss Emily got a swat on the bottom. Okay? We got good examples here. They're fresh. Why? Because she threw a sass, sass back at me when I told her to go uh, close the blinds. You know what I mean? And she had something to say. Now, I didn't hurt the child, but I walked over there. Come here. She comes over, and I said, I will not, I love you too much to allow you to have that kind of attitude towards authority. Won't do it. Boom. Of course, she lets out a howl that could, you know, win Academy Awards. I mean, and that did not, because she wants to see if that's going to change my mind. It's not, because I will not allow you to have that attitude. I will not. You need to love your kids enough to say, I will not let you be sexually active. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care if you love so-and-so. I will not be a party to your death because I know the number of sexually transmitted diseases that are out there. And if you think I'm overstating the case, yesterday I got a telephone call from a student. Mr. Mark. My girlfriend is pregnant. I wonder how that happened. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Panic, panic, panic. These were the same parents that were chewing me out when I said to them, don't let that child go over to his girlfriend's house when her parents are not there. Do not let them be sexually active. But Mr. Marks, you don't understand. Yes, I do. And it's the child calling me, not the parents, because the parents are embarrassed. Because guess what? I was right. Do not. Do you think the living God's going to allow you to continue to do whatever you want to do? Why do you think the Lord has allowed sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancies? Those are consequences, guys, and they hurt. God's not going to allow you to do it. Don't let your kids do it. It's important. So that's the key. And i got to close here in just a few seconds. We need to narrow down and hedge in our children's behavior into the path of wisdom so that when they become adults, they will be well set into the path of success. Does that make sense? Now, I could teach an entire class on this, and maybe I should. But I'm just going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say one other little thing about parenting before we move on. Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Too many people think that means that if I raise my kid in church, he's going to be a Christian when he's old. That's not what it means. 
It says, train up a child in the way he should go. The Hebrew words here for way he should go are actually the mouth of a river. And you go, what? In other words, he's saying, train up a child in the way that he's naturally bent. That's what you need to do as a parent. Now, again, I'm running out of time, so I want to, I want to explain this and, and do it relatively quickly. What we as parents need to do is figure out what our child's natural bend is and help them get into that path instead of trying to make them into what we think they should be. Now, I'm a college guy. I went to college. I've got degrees. I, I, I love to study. But my son is a mechanic. Is that bad? No. But how hard did I push him to go to college? Pretty darn hard. Until I found out he loves having his head stuck halfway into an F-18 engine. He talks about it all the time. I got this, I got that, and this cool thing. He's telling me all this. He's giving me all these terms, and I'm going, like, I get that. I know the pistons go like this. He goes, Dad, there's no pistons in an F-18 engine. And I'm going, whatever. Okay, I don't know. But he loves it. He eats it and sleeps it. He just thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. I mean, his happiest moment is grease from head to foot. But if I tried to make him into me, would it work? No, that's not Josiah. That's not his heart. You know, he just can't wait to get to his next command because he's going to be fixing a new engine. And I'm going, well, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, for you, but not for me, because I want to tell him about the latest thing. I read textbooks for entertainment. I do. I love them. And I want to tell him about the latest thing I've discovered. He's like, yeah, whatever, Dad. Okay, now, do you see what I'm saying? He's not me. Don't try to make your children into you. Try to figure out what their natural bend is and help them get into it. Instead of try, Does that make sense? Don't exasperate your children. That's what this, this, uh, this um, um, Ephesians 6, 4 says. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. It's the same thing. Now, this is the last point, and I'll be done. Here's the key. We need to discover that natural bend that God has built into our kids and guide them into it, okay? But you know what? You're a kid, aren't you? You're a kid. You're God's kid. And he's given you spiritual gifts, and he wants you to use those for him. You don't have to be me. You don't have to be a pastor. If you can't carry a tune in a bucket, do not try out for the worship team. Find out what your natural bend is and go do that. We have people here that are construction maniacs. They love that stuff. I know what a hammer is, but don't give me one. I will hurt something. I mean, you say, hammer in that nail, you're going to have to fix it. All right, because that's not me. But there are people here that they're, they live in that. We need to do the same thing that we do with our kids. Remember, God wants us to take and find the natural bend of our kids. He's saying, you spiritual leaders do the same thing. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope you learned something today. I'm sorry I went a little long. Let's pray.